the 2000s, the noughties, whatever you like to call it. The 2000s was the worst decade ever. Even worse than the 2010s. Trust me, but in many ways, the 2010s has been way better than the 2000s could ever be. And there's strong evidence to suggest that the reason the 2010s have been so shit is because of the 2000s. It's plop attitude and culture. Ugh. Now, before I take a colossal dump on the decade that you probably love, one you love so much that you share your little memes on the social media. You know the ones, the ones that say, <clears throat> Only kids who grew up in the 2000s will understand this. I will say a few kind things about the decade. Music-wise, it wasn't too bad because the golden age of grime and garage was undoubtedly in the 2000s. 100%. Not to mention it was a raw and exciting time for that scene. In fact, if you're on the website or YouTube, you can see a little playlist down below of those classics. Also, Dipset. Just look at those outfits. God damn and high contrast color music videos Mwah! and Michael Haneke made some bangers and The Wire and The Sopranos but aside from that it was a decade of dump and let's start with comedy in particular gross out comedy and political incorrectness comedy in particular TV and film was dump and it went too far this was the decade of gross out and politically incorrect jokes and often an overload of the two put together. We now live in a decade of ridiculous political correctness. So ridiculous, it's already become authoritarian and nasty and scary. Thing is, this doesn't surprise as the noughties went too far. And as is usually the case in history, the pendulum eventually swings the other way and it has swung hard. I have no problem with anti-PC comedy. In fact, check out some of my comedy to prove my point. But the noughties was guilty of just taking jokes too far and then repeating them over and over and over. I've always stated that I like to offend people as much as make them laugh. And if they end up just being offended and not laughing, then that's fine. I'm happy. The point is, this is a fire fighting fire situation. People offend me, so I offend them back. But there is a point to my offence, and that point is to make you think a bit. I offend you, and that should get you thinking. And if it doesn't get you thinking, well then you really are a noughties child. That's right, 2000s. I am better than you. The noughties was just a period where they were always trying to push the, push the envelope, step over the line, and often they would step over the line and push things too far, and it had no point to it. It wasn't funny, it wasn't clever. It was just, oh look, here's a retard. Sometimes there were very funny shows and movies. Take Star Stories, for example. Now these were outrageously offensive and most of the time they were very funny. But Star Stories is a show that sums up what I'm trying to say perfectly. Star Stories was always pushing, seeing how far they could go and you get some really funny moments like Paul Gascoigne here. But then I had a visit from an old friend from Newcastle. Gaza. Is that you? Hi. Feeling pretty sorry for yourself, aren't you, you stupid bitch? Gaza? Shut it and listen. You're a fucking Geordie. And we're the hardest race on earth. Look at you lying there like a big baby. But it only happened three hours ago, Gaza. You don't see me crying when things go wrong, do you? Now get out of that fucking bed and start walking. I'll try. He's right, you know. Do it. Do it now. Sorry about that, Miss Mills. Mr. Gascoigne shouldn't be on this ward. We keep him in the loony bin out the back. Then they'd always take it a little too far and just totally misfire. I'm a yiddo. But isn't yiddo an offensive term? I'm reclaiming it, like the poofs are done with queer. Hey, I'm looking for a leading lady for my new movie project, The Mask of Zaro. Fancy being in it, playing the part of a dirty spick wop. See? See, senor. Watching that today, I still feel the same way now as I did then. It just didn't sit right. I'm not gonna look back on it with fondness because now everything is OTT political correctness and cancel culture has all gone too far and no one's got a fucking sense of humour. I'm not gonna look at it with a contemporary lens and suddenly start applauding it, you know, going, oh wow, that was so brave. That's what comedy should have been about. That's right. No, I still look back at it and just go, hmm, no, you know, that was a bit too much. It went too far, it was stupid. And my values don't change because trends change. My values are very consistent. Yours should be too. Unless you're some sort of trend follower and end up looking like this. This stuff shouldn't be banned. Hell no. But you can call it out. Then you throw in gross out comedy and the 
general trend of grossness that embodied the entire decade. Gross out comedy wasn't born in the 2000s, arguably it was started by John Waters and popularised by the Farrelly brothers in the 1990s, but it was in the 2000s that there was an influx of not so funny and very cheap conveyor belt gross out comedy with strong un PC tones. Freddy Got Fingered, Road Trip, the Jackass movies, the umpteen American Pie sequels, the scary movie franchise, Ali G in the House, Van Wilder, Shall I Go On? Righteous Trash. Every comedy film in the noise was basically like this. Coming to theaters this January, a brand new outrageous comedy from the Dushkin twins. Johnny Knoxville is the retard. In order to get a scholarship to a stuffy old Ivy League school, Johnny Knoxville must become completely retarded. People are already saying it's the funniest movie of the decade. The retard's totally awesome. Yeah, dude, I love the part where Johnny Knoxville pukes and poops on that girl's boobs. Oh my god, that was so retarded. You won't want to miss The Retard, featuring Regina Hall, Jason Biggs, Anna Faris, with cameos from Rob Schneider, Polly Shore, and Smash Mouth. Oh, and Seth Green's in it for sure. He's gotta be. Gross out behavior leads me to my next point on why the 2000s was a colossal pile of stinking, steaming, putrid dump. And that's the general mean-spirited nature of the entire decade, culturally. Particularly the stuff you would see on the propaganda glow box, or what you plebs might call the television. Shows like Big Brother, which started out as some sort of faux intellectual experiment. Well, that's what Channel 4 called it. It went from being sort of interesting to just this, this horrid thing. Where every day it was like, well, let's see what nasty things we can do to these random people. Let's just make people, you know, do disgusting things and punish them for being human. And in turn, then you had other reality shows that were fucking horrid. You had I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, which the sole premise was is that you phone in and you vote for which z celebrity you wanted to either eat a platypus dick or just be dropped into a, a vat of, you know, shit guts, blood and fire ants. Soon Big Brother and every other wannabe reality TV show in that niche became a cheap demeaning shit show copied from the Japanese playbook of how to do good television. You see in the 90s we had Tarrant on TV and every week Chris Tarrant would show us clips from wacky Japanese game shows and we would laugh at how ridiculous and horrid they were. Then the 2000s came and we went from rightfully mocking this aspect of their culture to just copying it. This was a truly low point for TV entertainment and a surefire sign of how dumb we were being trained to be. Righteous trash. The mean-spirited nature of reality TV wasn't just about putting idiots on TV shows through bizarre horror trials. It also went as far as just duping people in order to make them look like absolute dickheads on TV. One show that springs to mind would be There's Something About Miriam. Okay, the premise of this show is very simple. A bunch of horny young men would be hanging out with some super hot chick, all competing to get in her knickers. The twist was that inside those knickers was a vagina made from Miriam's penis. Yes, she was transgender. This trick had been done before in Big Brother when Nadia was on the show but failed to mention that she was previously a he. This obviously wouldn't fly now. Oh, would it not fly now? But people loved it back then. It wasn't a hit, but people did enjoy watching others make complete fools of themselves. So, you know, because Gaz, Chaz and Baz were certainly not that open-minded enough to love Miriam for her riveting personality or her penis. Also, this kind of thing wouldn't have been cool in the 90s, to be honest. Except as a segment on The Word, another show that embraced grossness because Channel 4 was the edgelord of TV back then. And let's not forget Channel 4's role in the absolute destruction of culture and plummeting the nation of Great Britain's IQ level below 70. Now for those of you who aren't British, Channel 4 is the channel that comes after Channel 3, ITV, and before Channel 5. And it's probably most famous around the world for having these two personalities. Look at Channel 4. It gave us T4, Pop World, countless exploitation shows parading a social experiment, cutting edge TV events like Autopsy Live, Rehab Live, Big Brother of course, plus bullshit like Rape My Face, Distraction, and of course all the shows that starred Alex Zane. Righteous trash. And let's also not forget ITV's role in destroying the music industry with Pop Idol, 
pop stars in X Factor, signaling a new dawn of TV Corporation's monopoly on the Christmas number one spot for the rest of time. Nothing that came from these shows was good. So I guess we should talk about how awful music was. Where do I even start? To summarize the noughties as a decade, you could say it was a plastic polished dog shit and the music reflected this culture perfectly. Let's start with pop music in general and the bubblegum boy band and female solo artist factory. You don't need to hear the music, just look at the state of these people. The 2000s was the decade where hip hop reached stadium rock star status. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the majority of hip hop music in the noughties was very plastic, overproduced, radio friendly, vacuous and slick with no substance. During this decade, hip hop seeped into every aspect of culture right across the board. Just take the term bling bling. Even though bling bling was termed right at the tail end of the 90s, in the 2000s, everybody started using the term bling bling and it got very annoying. Even your gran said bling bling. Suddenly everything had to have some sort of urban tinge to it, whether it was high end fashion, children's TV shows, McDonald's Happy Meals, even the Antiques Roadshow. And what was worse about it is that every single new song or artist sounded the same because there was a certain sound that produced hits and these were made by just three different producers or by others outright stealing their style. Timberland, Neptunes and Dr. Dre and then sometimes Kanye West and Little John. This is no exaggeration and by the second half of the decade every pop song was produced by one of these three or Little John or someone sounding like them. And don't get me wrong, I love these producers. I didn't mind hearing Justin Timberlake and Nelly Furtado hits, you know, 400 times a day on the radio. But the point is, no artist had an original sound. I certainly didn't care who the rapper or singer was. It was a good Timberland beat, that's all I cared about. But as the demand for these sounds increased, the quality diminished, and every throwaway beat produced by these lot was just being shoveled out to any fuck for about 100k a pop. Everyone was doing it. Let's not forget about pop-infused gangster rap ballads, aka tunes made by Ja Rule, Jesus Christ. And gangster rap became the norm. Shameless promotion of gun-toting gangster culture was big, big business. And in my country, little road men were shooting each other more often than usual. It was a morally bankrupt period of culture. Corporate whore rappers and their masters glorifying the worst aspects of ghetto culture. I ain't into censorship, I'm into taking responsibility. And I doubt Dr. Dre has ever considered his responsibilities in his Malibu mansion. Let's pretend that the worst attributes of white suburban areas is the fact that they enslave Eastern Europeans and keep them under the stairs. Now let's imagine that the biggest musical movement to come out of the white suburban areas is emo rock. Now let's imagine that emo rock glorifies the enslavement of Eastern Europeans and everyone says you're not a real honky from the suburbs unless you've got an Estonian shackled in your basement shining your shoes. What a disgrace. Now I know that the 90s and now has been full of this glorification of this type of behavior. But the levels of irresponsibility in the 2000s is kind of incomparable. Let's not pretend anymore, okay? The hype that surrounded 50 Cent was the fact that he got shot nine times. Now compare that to the hype that surrounds Juice World or Post Malone and them talking about their feelings. Quite the contrast now. And then there was all these teeny bop indie bands called The Something. I know some like Razor Light and Franz Ferdinand weren't called the Razor Light or the Franz Ferdinand, but guaranteed at some point someone would have called them as such. So my point stands. This music dominated the charts and every music outlet for way too long. All you had were floppy haired annoying students prancing around singing their boring songs whilst wearing a blazer. I'm singing about a girl who hates me wearing my blazer. It was pure wackery. End of argument. But by far the worst and most embarrassing thing to happen to music in the noughties came in the early part of the decade. New metal went pop. In the 90s, yeah I love the 90s don't I? Bands emerged from LA with this new aggressive sound with down tuned guitars. It was brooding and it was hard music and their songs were about how they were molested by a step parent. It was wonderful. Then five or so years later, Limp Bizkit decided to release Rolling. New metal wasn't called new metal in the 90s. 
but once it had found its name, it successfully memed itself into ridicule. Rowling introduced a flabby, vacuous, plastic age of nonsense that shared more in common with the pompous and ludicrous hair metal of the 80s. Watching Fred Durst gurn around in a car with Ben Stiller whilst a group of dancing girls parade around with rims was the worst thing I'd ever witnessed. And I've been out in Southampton. Look how ridiculous this is. I remember seeing Limp Bizkit's first show in the UK supporting Korn. It was fun. Their first album was fun and quite good, but they turned into this, and in turn new metal top five hits followed, and then Linkin Park. I don't mind Linkin Park, I think they made some good songs, but the mix of college boy raps and overly produced slick music didn't cut it for me. Rock music became just overly produced, too slick and uncomfortably corporate. It literally made Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine seem like they're a 70s art rock collective of age gypsies from Wyoming. Let's not also forget about the rise of emo rock, the rise of EDM music and its vacuousness, and how dubstep went from being underground music from Croydon to Skrillex. We've been paying the price for that ever since. Plus the rise of streaming led to the death of the music industry, which in turn led to a whole period of just mediocrity and safety. Though it did give birth to the SoundCloud age, and we are forever grateful for that I suppose, but, mm. but there's also music festivals to consider, and how they changed. In the 90s, yeah the 90s again, I fucking love it. In the 90s, people said the Glastonbury Festival had become way too commercial and had lost its soul and wasn't what it was. <laughs> well, they were in for a shock. The 2000s saw prices skyrocketing, fences being made higher to stop the riffraff coming in, legions of London idiots and designer wellies descended upon each festival, sipping Prosecco and eating vegan muck. Suddenly there were like 10,000 festivals each summer, jam-packed with yuppies, yayas, and middle-class people with their snotty kids. Kids! Disgusting. Now I'm wearing a plaster under my eye, which must mean I'm gonna talk about Nelly. I don't have a problem with Nelly. In fact, I love country grammar when it came out. Okay, Nelly did make some questionable hits during the decade and continues to do so. But the fact is, you might hate singy rap. I like melodic singing rap. I'm a big fan of it. But you might hate it. And therefore, you hate modern music because of the noughties and because of Nelly. So therefore, that's another reason for you to call out the 2000s as the worst decade ever. Not for me. I'm just adding fuel to your fire. Now that we've shitted all over music, let's shit all over fashion. That is a piece of piss. I give you exhibit alphabet, A to Z, Burberry and Von Dutch. Open and shut case, Johnson. What about drugs then, eh? Huh. Huh. Seem to be in a completely different place. My plaster's got bigger. I think I fucked the continuity. Hmm. Ah, who cares? Drugs in the 2000s. Big boo boo. Remember Meow Meow? NCAT? And all the variations of weird internet drugs that flooded in from China? Absolute filth, the lot of it. Every week the chemistry would be changed just a little bit to alter the lettering to make it still legal. They just couldn't keep up. That's the police, of course. The average person who uh, liked to indulge in a bit of Meow Meow was pretty much a regular normie type person. These kind of people were the kind of people that didn't even like to smoke weed or snort cocaine. And they'd actually take MCAT and such drugs uh, just because it was legal. Uh, nothing to do with the fact that it absolutely destroyed your body and your mind. In fact, those internet drugs perfectly encapsulate the vacuous, disgusting bubblegum sheen that was wrapped around the most regrettable decade. Then there's haircuts and tattoos, mainly because of David Beckham. You see, before the 2000s, for example, the 90s, yeah, I love it. people who had tattoos were like, you know, sailors, gang members and bikers, you know, hard nuts and things. But in the 2000s, David Beckham uh, revolutionized uh, tattoo fashion. Every prick had a tattoo, you know, and every prick has a tattoo now, whether it be some sort of disgraceful tribal print going up your arm. Or, you know, getting Chinese writing that actually translated as, I am a shit cunt. <sighs> on your wrist. Suddenly people thought it was perfectly acceptable to have, you know, Bart Simpson tattooed on their chest. 
or the Coca-Cola symbol on their butt cheeks. David Beckham is responsible for that. And David Beckham is also responsible for a terrible, terrible, terrible haircut trend. You remember the David Beckham haircut trend? Remember that haircut he had? In the 90s, you had Rachel from Friends haircuts for ladies, and men just had floppy hair like Keanu Reeves. Whereas in the 2000s, everyone looked like they had a practical joke played on them when they got too drunk and passed out on the living room floor. But now they were paying for that kind of haircut, paying a lot of money and looking ridiculous. I named these things offensive haircuts. Yes, that's right. Their hair offended me and still does to this day. In fact, that's why I became quite an offensive person. To fight fire with fire. Now, obviously, the noughties led to the destruction of communication and uh, the widening of the bipartisanship of humanity because of social media and mobile phone technology. Although you couldn't blame the whole thing on the noughties for the state we're in now because obviously this technology was coming about before and you know, the rampant progress of it was in the 2010s. But the 2000s definitely played its part, so it's worth a mention. Well, I've said there all is to be said, isn't it? Oh shit, how did I forget that? The Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, the war on terror, and the 2008 recession. They're all pretty shit. Well look, the post 9-11 age of terrorist fear and needless war doesn't really need to be explained, does it? I don't need to go into great detail about why the age of fear that reduced our freedoms through horrendous hate speech laws and invasive mass surveillance should be considered to be a proper dud decade. The recession though, that is something else. The 2000s was full of TV shows promoting buying houses and flipping them for profit. There was this whole stupid ideology that you just buy a house, paint the walls a certain shade of eggshell white, and then you can sell it for £20,000 profit. It was a stupid time. Even little roadmen thought they shouldn't give up road life until they were like earning 60k a year and flipping council flats in the ghetto. It was a ridiculous time. This whole ideology led up to a massive financial crash and we lost Woolworths. But what was worse still was the name they decided to give it in the first place. They didn't call it the recession. They called it the credit crunch. Like some bizarre chocolate bar that just brought you misery. That name alone sums up the decade. Stupid, plastic, vacuous, meaningless drivel. Covering up a big stinking pile of dump. Credit crunch. The axis of evil. Operation Iraqi Freedom. Bling bling. Fuck off. Anyway, that's it. So if you like that, you like other things, you should check out my website. You should also, you know, like this, share it around. Because, you know, you're probably out there sharing around all your venereal diseases, so you might as well share my video too. Just do all them kind of things. Subscribe, click the bell, whatever platform you are. Join in the phone, but mainly go to my beautiful website. Sign up there. There's lots of literature. There's lots of interesting and crazy and wonderful things there. Plus, it's the best way to support a genius creator like myself. There's all kinds of things on there. And plus, when I'm sending you an email on a weekly basis, you'll feel like you have a new friend.